what I'm going to do is I'm going to share with you, I only got like a couple, three slides deliberately uh, to share with you two things about what we view uh, from Asana's perspective, what's next in session border controllers. And there's two sort. I'll get, also give you the sources of my data. One, my, my august wisdom, if you want to call it that, what I've learned, not just within Sonus, but, uh, but also a lot of things are shared by my co-panelists. We, we're seeing the same things. But also I factor in the, the input that we've gotten back from the Sonus customer base. Um, for those of you who may be familiar, in the, in the 10 years Sonus has been shipping and, and VoIP solutions, our install base is running about 35 billion minutes of use every month of which the Sonus MBS is a component. So I kind of think they, they might know what they're doing. So, anywho. Uh, first of all, the other byproduct of the session uh, is that uh, although a session border controller is absolutely a, a mandate for successful pairing for all the things we've already discussed, the session management, call control, protection, uh, I'm a security weenie, okay? When I, first, when I first joined Sonus, I wouldn't know Erling if I tripped over it. Conversely, there are people that do, and one of the things that we've also found that since if you build the total solution, the policy server, the EMS, the provisioning, the billing, they have to be protected as well. So they're in the concept of what is referred to as the fence and death. And a byproduct is that, you know, attacks are, in, in the IP voice world, they're not new, they're just what's in vogue. Um, go back and, and, and do some Googles and fun things with SMTP or web attacks or SQLs uh, injections. And so, and also we're finding, talking with customers, that a number of the threats are internal. Uh, it isn't that necessarily people are bad, uh, just that they, they go home, crank up the laptop, some kid goes to an anime site while dad's VPNed into the knock, gets something they shouldn't have, and it gets and locks up and goes into the network behind the firewall. Nothing can stop that. And then also a number of our customers, and once again, I'm sure my colleagues agree with this as well, that uh, carriers are in fact using the public internet in an increased way for connectivity to reach people like you and me, the consumer models. Now, what do you do? Do you throw up your hands? No. Work items. Uh, lots of sources for you guys to look at. Um, yes, market analysts are important. One thing I would highly recommend um, is that there is an organization called the VoIP Security Alliance, or VoIPSA. I would strongly recommend that you uh, consider going to the website, consortium of vendors, uh, security vendors, VoIP vendors, where they do have things like threat models, risk models, things that get you started. Standards bodies, all sorts of alphabet soup. Um, ISO standards around controlling the management plane give you guidance. On the other side of the house where I came from, the traditional security vendors realize that voice over IP is a growing market. And in fact, that they have their contributions in areas of things like intrusion de uh, detection and protection, uh, content filtering, digital rights management to augment the SBC function, which this panel is about. And then the carriers themselves. I know for a fact there are folks here who are members of the VPF that have excellent security policies for their network. Uh, everything from passwords to logging and what have you. And then finally, my, my own personal soapbox, uh, protecting the perimeter alone is insufficient. You have to ensure that the elements in the network themselves are protected and hardened, which is the part of the SANA secure network policy. Okay, what do folks want to do? Well, this is what they tell me. Some of the obvious things, they want to do peering exchange VoIP traffic uh, with others for whatever reason, hence why the VPS exists. Value-added services at the edge, uh, transcoding, uh, inner working of DTMF types or fax types. Uh, strong centralized policy making use of least cost routing. Uh, we're going to come back to that in a little bit. How do I get to legacy devices, non-SIP devices, MGC, you know, MGCP, H323? They still exist in, in parts of the geographies of the world. This next one's really important. The third from the bottom, they want to be able in the same box, in the same enclosure, be able to connect the circuit networks and packet networks simultaneously, where as time moves and as customers move to IP, that in fact you can do it on a gradual basis and you don't need additional hardware and you don't have to do a flag day upgrade. Be able to do in-field upgrades without taking the box down, and, you know, what is sometimes referred to as live software update. And then to pull this all together, I want to be able to bill a TDM call just the same way I bill an IP call. So that's kind of the, the high-level summary. Now, what are some of the attributes under the skins? First, to, be, to provide a carrier-grade uh, platform. Uh, once again, that's one of the benefits I have as a Sonos NBS product manager is that I'm drawn upon hardware that's got 10 years under its belt. And at its heart, it is, in fact, a voice switch. 
It should be able to be, uh, be used in either appearing or access deployments, uh, depending on uh, your customer's needs. Value-added services, uh, you can actually charge that, by the way. Uh, I have one customer who does exactly that. They have uh, the Sonus MBS at two edges of their network, and they charge uh, so many cents or whatever per transcode. That's all they do, and it's been that way for four years. So it doesn't have to do a lot. Like, like Glenn was mentioning, it can do certain things. Be scalable in the field through upgrades, as I mentioned about the ease on the software stuff, but also hardware, wide range of signaling, coexistence, of, like I say, of, of both circuit and packet, and be able to provide protection end-to-end, -end, following both not only routing policy, LCR, the obvious things, but also security policy across the elements. So that's pretty much it. Like I said, uh, no need to panic. Uh, there's a lot of good information out there. Um, in the sense of, like I say, there's uh, sources not only in the vendor community, but also, like I say, in the standards. Okay, thanks.